So here we are on our first ever Don't Be Insecure podcast, where we bring you CISOs and other security leaders to talk and have candid conversations about their security programs, what they're doing, what they're not doing, current events around cybersecurity and technology, uh, and just what they're doing to support their teams and build their visions of security at their organizations. So Joe, uh, why don't you take us away with a quick introduction of yourself um, and then I can chime in and share who I am and we'll introduce our first guest. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Shane. My name is Joe Woodwell. I've been in security since 1998 when at EMC slash Data General, I was tasked with leading a, uh, uh, our team, at the healthcare team at EMC in HIPAA security and all of our clients and customers and making sure to help them make that transition effectively. Um, Shane and I have worked together at Qualys the past uh, almost five years. Uh, I'm now at Strike Ready, um, and so so uh, looking forward to to that new adventure. But uh, but have worked with Shane the last what three years or so? Yeah, that's about right. Awesome, thanks, Joe. Uh, I'm Shane Crane. Been in technology and security for about 15 years now. Started all the way at the lowly uh, help desk, worked my way up through some desktop support and sysadmin stuff, all the way to deploying EDR and remote management tools. And like Joe, kind of shifted into consulting and selling a few years back in the cybersecurity space. So I'm over at Qualys, uh, helping enterprise customers evaluate, purchase, and deploy our security and compliance tools. So uh, a little bit about me and my free time, I... Uh, spend all of it with a couple of littles and my wife uh, and nerd out on tech with security folks. So uh, Joe, with that said, I am super pumped to get this podcast off the ground. Uh, we have an exciting first guest and some really good topics today. Uh, why don't you share who our guest is going to be and a little bit about him? Well, the thing that excites me about our next guest is that he has an opinion uh, and, is, and is very vocal online. He's an, a published author of at least half a dozen books, if not more, um, got his start with the NSA back at the height of the Cold War in 1984 and worked his way up through a number of positions, as you'll hear from him directly. Um, he's also uh, recently served as the chief security architect at Walmart. And so um, our, our guest uh, has a number of, of experiential uh, positions that I think would will benefit you and uh, will give you some some pause and perspective on current trends in the industry. And cool. I guess I'm pumped to talk to Ira Winkler. Today. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I need to introduce him by name and let you know that we're going to be speaking with Ira Winkler. All good. Cool. Yeah. And some of the topics that we have to talk to him about today include breaches, some recent breaches, some kind of historic breaches. Uh, how MFA and PCI and other re regulations relate to security and compliance. And we'll even dive a little bit into risk optimization. So let's, uh, let's jump in and chat with Ira. Sounds great. Modern businesses live in a multi-cloud SaaS enabled world where cloud security is supposed to be modern, nimble, and easy. But is it really? If you rely on one tool to manage your cloud security posture, another to manage vulnerabilities, one for your external attack service, and still another to manage your SaaS apps, you'll never know the real risk across your entire environment when you're drowning in a sea of findings from disparate cloud security tools, which only clouds your visibility instead of providing you visibility into your cloud. Introducing Total Cloud 2.0, the AI-powered cloud-native application protection platform with true risk insights that sheds light on the core premise that risks in the cloud are not merely additive, but in fact, multiplicative. And when you combine a vulnerability with a misconfiguration and then compound it with exposure to the internet, your risk escalates significantly into a much higher threat. True Risk Insights correlates unique risk indicators from diverse Qualys sources, including Six Sigma vulnerability detection, AI-powered threat detection, externally exposed assets, cloud misconfigurations, and asset criticality, giving you one prioritized view of risk so you can fix what matters most first. 
Total Cloud 2.0 is the first and only CMAP solution that extends a protective shield around your favorite SaaS apps like Microsoft 365, Zoom, Slack, and more. Making them just as secure as your cloud infrastructure. Stop letting this disparate collection of cloud security tools cloud your visibility. See your cloud infrastructure, SaaS apps, and externally exposed assets more clearly with a unified, prioritized view of risk. Get total cloud security with Total Cloud 2.0 from Qualys. Your cloud de-risked. You're an author, um, a speaker, a noted speaker, and a uh, noted CISO. You're well known in the in the cyber community. But for some of our viewers who may not know you, would you take a, a few minutes to just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, maybe even how you got started? Um, yeah. Uh, well. The anecdote is I was a psychology major in college and the only people that would hire me was the U.S. government. <laughs> so luckily I took some tests and did well on the tests and ended up getting a job at NSA. Started out as an intel analyst working in the National Signals Intelligence Operations Center, you know, their 24-hour watch center. And then I got, um, got was accepted into the computer intern program where I was cross-trained to do computer type of stuff. And when I was doing that, I did cryptanalysis. I could joke and say my first computer was a Cray. And unfortunately, nobody would actually think that's impressive anymore. But, um, you know, I could say my first computer was a Cray. I ended up doing cryptanalysis, support to field operations, spent some time driving around little green trucks in Europe for a while during the Cold War, and eventually left the government, ended up working for government contractors, where one day they said, Hey, can, instead of going to the Pentagon, can you make a few phone calls? And three days later, I had control over one of the world's largest investment banks. My company had a policy that if you wrote a paper that was accepted to a professional conference, they'd have to send you. So I wrote up how to take over a bank. I didn't realize it. You know, all I knew was it was a quick abstract to send in. Turned out to be the USENIX Security Conference, which at the time was the most prestigious conference in the industry, or at least one of them. And I presented and it was called the seminal work in social engineering. And I had to look up what seminal meant and what social engineering meant. But people came to me to do more and more things like break into companies. And like they say, can you get a job undercover, you know, get a job as a temporary employee at our company and rob us blind? I'm like, sure. And then I had to learn how to hack. And then I would go on the internet and I'd be like, this is probably relevant. I'd go on the internet and I'd be like, how to hack computers? And it'd be like, okay, try default passwords. I'm like, default pass? Are you kidding me? Anyway, then it'd be like, okay, try, you know, unpatched systems, like exploiting, you know, this type. Looking at, um, you know, universally mounted or like hard drives mounted to the world. And I'm like, that's not hacking. That's just taking advantage of bad system administration and all that stuff. So anyway... I just took advantage of bad system administration and was able to do a bunch of stuff. I was one of the, I ended up um, serendipitously being one of the lead investigators on the Citibank break-in in 1994, which was the first major financial crime via computers that was investigated and prosecuted and arresting people overseas. So proud of that work. Ended up um, going to the National Computer Security Association, which is now ICSA Labs, where I ran the antivirus and firewall product certification programs there. I left there and started my own company and ended up, you know, growing the company, selling it to HP and became chief security strategist at HP. Along the way, I wrote several books, you know, my first book, Corporate Espionage. Actually, you know, people were saying, oh, that's like a good book and everything. It turned out to be a 300 page business card, which gave me my jump start. Then over the years, I've, you know, after I left HP, did strategic consulting, started another company in 2012 called Secure Mentum, which focused on the human aspects of cybersecurity. Again, focusing on social engineering and the like, still ended up doing a lot of incident response. If people want some entertainment, Google Ira Winkler and Syrian Electronic Army. And boy, did I get under their skin. And that turned out to be, again, another major you know, investigation of an organization and stopping them cold. Um, so anyway, have that, 
ended up selling that company over a while became a CISO, you know, cause I thought, wow, I, you know, after I sold my company, I was like, I was never really a CISO before. So I became a CISO for a really good company that was mostly focused on the sled area, state, local, and education, you know, helping to secure them. And boy, do they need that. Then moved over, was recruited by Walmart to be chief security architect there. And now I'm the CISO over at Sci, which is an Israeli company that does cyber risk quantification, but really it's cyber risk optimization, focusing again, and it's refreshing working with nation state level people again, and actually having a product because I'll say it this way, and then I'll shut up. But um, generally, I've said since 1996 in my first book, the major problem in cybersecurity is that CISOs are getting the budgets and resources that they deserve, not the budgets that they need. And they need to learn to deserve what they need. And so anyways, um, Sai, you know, has this product, which is really great on risk optimization that literally does exactly what I was advocating, how to get the budgets you need by saying, what's the value of a vulnerability? What is the cost to mitigate that? And then going ahead and creating plans based upon that data with machine learning, artificial intelligence. God, those are so cliche, but um, (laughs) let's just say lots of mathematics instead. I do have a patent on machine learning for figuring out how to determine um, highly susceptible, which is, I forgot the exact title, but determining user susceptibility to phishing attacks using a variety of psychological assessments and applying cluster analysis to that. So anyway, and that, that essentially, and just in case you care, and this is like another topic, you can shut me up at any time. It's your podcast. But basically, you know, there are certain traits that when you look at a person makes them more susceptible, but it's not universal. But what happens is when you start looking at balancing different traits, kind of like a mix con- mix console that a DJ would have, like or like a music producer would have, like bring up a little bit of bass, bring down the tenor or whatever those things are called. I'm not a musician, but when you start adjusting all those little slides, you can start to hone in on which combination of psychological traits make someone more or less vulnerable to phishing as an example. Mm. I got I've got a I, I want to riff off of that because mm-hmm. um, I see a combination of cyber and psychology uh, in your in your background coming to coming to work there and yeah, you kind of took that. Yeah. <laughs> it is yeah, ironic. It's, it's really intriguing and and Shane and I uh, like this idea of operationalize or not operationalizing but quantifying your risk based on asset value, for example, and marrying that with the vulnerabilities that exist on that asset and the opportunity to remediate them. So I I think that's an interesting story, but um, I wonder if you could apply those personality traits from individual users to actual companies as well, because we had that recent, and you wrote about this on LinkedIn, Mm -hmm. we had the recent um, issue with 23andMe and MFA, and there are some companies that do MFA, Qualys, where I used to work and where Shane still works today, right. we, we used MFA, um, but there are other companies who don't. And it's not for a lack of financial wherewithal, right? I think, it, I think like you are pointing out really astutely, it's, it's, a, um, it's probably a function of, of, uh, of just somebody making the case for why they need MFA. And you pointed out, hey, if you're not going to do MFA, then you deserve it. This is how I read it. Yeah. <laughs> you just to be hacked, right? Yeah. So t- t- tell us a little bit more about that. So, for example, when you, when you look at a countermeasure like MFA, and here's the issue. MFA, like everybody says, oh, it's not perfect, blah, blah, blah. The fact of the matter is MFA is still makes an organization exponentially more secure with it than without it in general. It adds an extra layer of complexity. It takes away a lot of the automation of many attacks. I'm not necessarily a fan of what they call MFA pushes, where, for example, you could set up Microsoft Authenticator where somebody logs in with the user ID and password, and then it says, was that you? And then somebody will say, I, I, no, it wasn't me. Then it'll be, was that you? You know, criminal will keep logging in. Was that you? And it'll be like, no, nah, not me. Then the third time, user's like, just let me accept it and, you know, let it get going. Maybe it's something I don't understand. So that's an MFA fatigue attack as an example. But theoretically, why isn't the organization locking people out after multiple MFA failures? So that could stop that to a certain extent. But 
then going on to the point though, when you have all these different things, you know, like obviously I was at Walmart. When you're at Walmart, one of the things you have to balance is security versus ease of business. And frankly, every organization in the world at one level or another has to balance, mm-hmm. you know, business versus ease of use, even in cybersecurity. Mm-hmm. You know, we can't have the, the phrase in user interface is friction. We don't want to create unnecessary friction with the user. And sometimes if a user's like, I don't know about you, but there have been times I've been logging on. Okay, now go ahead and create, you know, your MFA and accept your MFA. And I'm like, I just wanted to buy a, you know, a Coke from a vending machine. Why am I doing this? And, you know, you say it becomes a balance where companies can't necessarily force higher levels of security on users depending on the relationship with them. So that's one concern where MFA could theoretically be useful, but also potentially be a negative and an organization has to make a conscious decision, which kind of goes towards the cyber risk quantification. And also, you know, I like my current company. It's not just like the quantification itself. It's the probabilities and determining, for example, by incorporating attack paths, like let's assume a user is going to fail with MFA, or let's assume we can stop attacks with MFA, but it might be too much friction. It might be too much difficulty or cost. But if we could go ahead and look at an attack path and say, okay, if a user account gets compromised, MFA is one potential solution, but then we have these other potential solutions, which might include looking at the domain where they're coming from. It might include a form of MFA like cookies on the system, where, okay, if we have a cookie on the system that a person regularly uses, That's almost another form of MFA that's invisible to the user without forcing them to authenticate. Now, I'm not going to advocate one over the other. That's why I like the application of machine learning and other mathematical principles to the decision-making process, because then you could go ahead and determine what is the potential exposure with or without MFA, and are there other places to potentially mitigate the damage? So for example, You know, let's say people log into an account and the account is, has minimal accesses. And not only does it have minimal accesses, the, you know, it, it will only send out certain types of data. So for example, there used to be cases when I would investigate incidents where help desks would go ahead and they had all this data and people working on help desks would steal information. And then I'm like, okay, why don't you change the user interface so that a credit card number doesn't come up in full because this person does not have the need to actually see the full credit card number and changing user interfaces and mitigating, like even if somebody does get in, there's other controls to stop and mitigate damage proactively or at least limit the damage. So there's all these balancing effects. I think I asked your question, but I totally forgot what it was by now. <laughs> yeah, is, is there, is there a, a, an opportunity to um, kind of, just as we have the four or five major personality traits in people, op- trade openness, blah, blah, blah. Are, can we quantify personalities in companies uh, that would, where you could highly recommend or strongly recommend due to their vertical I- industry or market or something along those lines that they definitely take on a a policy of implementing MFA. Well, yeah, for example, there are some um, regulations which require it by default, depending on the industry and things like that. So yeah, that that was your original question. Can, are there personality traits of companies? Now, the thing is when we actually look at companies, you know, in the, sorry, I I really don't mean this to be a product pitch, but you know, when, with our current, so the hybrid solution, when people join up by looking at certain types, like what's the, you know, what is the organizational revenue? What industry are people in? What geographies are people in? We can pretty much say with a high probability that here are the general assets you have, here are the general threats that you have, and here are going to be the likely countermeasures you really need to implement. And that cuts across, you know, the industry. And then you start funneling down by size, by geographies, and you could start to see trends in the countermeasures organizations need. 
Is, is that something, and I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Shane because he's got a question on this very topic with respect to um, a recent happening, but um, Shane, go ahead. No, no you're, you're good, Joe. Okay. So, um, go ahead. No, I was well, just going to say, does, does this, does this, could this have, could that kind of an approach have impacted in a positive way, maybe even prevented what happened at Microsoft, which you wrote about? As so, well? I mean, the latest attack at Microsoft that I put up today and, you know, the team did a really good job analyzing that MFA could help. The problem is that this is what I would call, like there's a phrase called black swan. If you read, um, you mm -hmm. know, never split the difference. And a black swan is something that you really don't conceive happening. And now the thing is, in this case, it's they did not have multi-factor, what appears to be the case, they did not have multi-factor authentication on a certain subset of like on a particular system, which is one system out of countless systems. I'm not trying to, I don't know whether or not what they did was reasonable at the end of the day. But when it's when everybody's like, oh, this is such an easy hack. And I'm like, if it was such an easy hack, why did it take a nation state to do it? <laughs> why wasn't this hack? Because m countless people target Microsoft. You had a really probe for this one individual system to find the vulnerability, to get in. And then once you're in, to kind of dig deep and look around. And again, look at attack pass as an example to figure out how to stop it. Now, I'm not going to say in any way, shape, or form what Microsoft did was perfect, but I've long learned, like there was another case, for example, in JP, you know, JP Morgan Chase, which did things really, really great. And I don't know how many people remember this incident, but there was a case where they came out and they said 70 million credit cards were compromised. There was a system with, that did not have MFA, that should have had MFA per PCI, per, you know, per all these things. We screwed up. We're going to deal with it. And the thing was, everybody came out and said, okay, they screwed up. And we forgot about that the next day. They caught the bad guys a few months later. But still, you have an organization that just acknowledged, we totally missed this. And why do they totally miss it? Again, it's the sheer scope of certain organizations that becomes a problem. And M yes, MFA in this case would have stopped this, according to the researchers, uh, my threat intelligence team that looked at this, but they didn't have it on this one thing. And yeah, they should have, but you know, I find, I find it hard to criticize much like the solar winds case, you know, it took a nation state level actor to compromise and go in so deep with unlimited resources, unlimited time to actually find the vulnerability. Again, not that what they did was perfect in Microsoft, but it's you can't necessarily say, oh, what a bunch of morons. Let's let's talk about that. If I can pivot to that one, Shane, uh, and I don't mean to be stepping on your toes, <laughs> but, but you just brought it up, Iris, so I've got to kind of like at least acknowledge that. And that is that um, there's no doubt that the SolarWinds hack is changing how even the federal government and the SEC is looking at uh, such incidences and reporting and material information that needs to be shared with not just the board, but with the SEC. Um, so my question for you is, um, are they overstepping their bounds? And number two, um, is, is this finally what is needed for CISOs to kind of take that next level up and start reporting to not just to a CFO, or to a CEO, but to report directly to boards. Do you see an evolution? This forcing that evolution. So let me let me take let me let me get back to your last thing first. The CISO should always the CISO doesn't report to the board. Nobody reports to the board except the CEO. The CFO again, massive requirements still reports into the CEO. So we need to respect that chain of command. They have to inform the board on how things should be done. They have to provide the right mm -hmm. input to the board, but it doesn't mean that the board, it, you know, it doesn't mean they report, to, you know, th th they are managed by the board right. because a lot of people just totally don't understand the function of a board, even though I know you do. I just want to clear that up first. But now with regard to Tim Brown and everything else, I... 
You know, I like Tim. And in some ways, I think Tim was probably over his head. I think in many ways, solar winds threw him under the proverbial bus. Because, you know, you look at this, and I think a lot of CISOs up until this time did not take, I don't want to say they didn't take it seriously, but they didn't realize the implications of signing a paper. So, for example, I read the SEC complaint, and the SEC complaint says, Tim Brown informed management, Tim Brown informed management, Tim Brown informed management. But then they say, Tim Brown didn't inform management, so we're going to charge him specifically. And you can't have it both ways. So there's that dichotomy that I keep getting confused by when I read the complaint, because it constantly says he did this, you know, but, you know, that he reported to people, but then says, okay, and they are negligent because they didn't listen to him, but not personally. And then it says, well, Tim Brown didn't report critical failings. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? So that's issue number one. Does the SEC have a responsibility to say this? And the question is, and this is where it comes up, Tim Brown, essentially, the Joe Sullivan case, because everybody tries to equate it, two totally different cases. Joe Sullivan was a lawyer, actually a federal prosecutor, before he was at Uber, who then made a choice to cover up. And again, there's no way around it. It was a cover up by saying, oh, we were hacked, but we're going to put it through this one channel to pay the people without actually having to report it. And while they were under active investigation for mishandling another breach, that is not the case of what happened with Tim Brown. In Tim Brown's case, did he do everything perfectly? No, I don't think any CISO is doing everything they could perfectly. But then it's saying, okay, he was hacked, but then there's all these issues and the environment wasn't perfect, things that added to the problem. And again, this I know this might sound like a tangent, but it's not. You know, they were using internal messaging where engineers were saying, ha, 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 you know, how could we say this stupid thing? Well, there's a difference between me saying there are reasonable controls in an organization and saying it's perfect. Now, they're saying people inside think he was, you know, not telling the truth or whatever, but there's, you don't, there's no such thing as perfection, but then you're taking idle chatter. And this is a concern that should worry all the CISOs. What are people saying internally? Like, for example, like when you have a communication that says this, it can be perceived in the wrong way. For example, I have a friend who's the CISO of a major Fortune 200 organization. I was using their organization's app and found an issue with the privacy of the app. And I didn't say, hey, I found a privacy issue, blah, blah, blah. Here's the details of it and email it to him. I said, hey, you know, I was just using your app and I, you know, or I was just, you know, I appreciate, you know, you know, your company and everything. Do you mind if I, you know, give you some, you know, can we get on a call and have some feedback? And luckily he read between the lines. So I didn't, he's like, why specifically do you want to talk? You got to worry about what people are writing internally. That's random chatter from people who don't understand the overall implications versus what actually matters. Because again, it could be taken in all the wrong ways. And so anyway, I could just go on for that, but I'll see what questions you have because I know we have limited time. Yeah. No, that's that's great stuff, Ira. And I, we don't need to unpack the MFA stuff. <laughs> I love how you were talking about the different you know, tiers, right? There could be some random person walking into Walmart to buy a Coke or going to a vending machine versus someone who's uh, logging into their banking app, right? And then you mm-hmm. absolutely got to enforce some form of MFA, right? So it's It's always good to kind of step back and take that perspective. So I appreciate that. Um, On a little bit uh, different topic, and you mentioned actually PCI, MFA, and needing MFA, uh, but topically PCI uh, 4.0 is coming up soon, right? In a couple of months here. So I'm curious to get your take on what you think about 4.0 and if you think that that's going to maybe add some teeth for PCI DSS going forward. And actually, sorry, before you answer that uh, elephant in the room, I have to ask, and this is not a security question, but that's a surfboard in your background, right? 
Yeah, I, I couldn't see that. But yeah, that's how uh, he mentioned early on the P90X stuff and things like that. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm a beach body coach or well used to be till they changed us to beach body. Cons- I forgot. I don't even body partners, <laughs> but um, generally that I won that surfboard and has all the workout programs they have. And it's more ornamental. than. Ah, OK, so you don't actually surf. I do not. I have never been surfing. Even when I went on my last cruise, I did not get on their little wave thing. All right. But that's a cool, very cool story. Yeah. (laughs) It is signed by Tony Horton, if you are a P90X fan. I know. It was hard to carry that around to where I knew he was at an event to sign. But (laughs) they admired my diligence. (laughs) So what do you think about the PCI changes? Meaningful? So here's the thing. I'm, I'm going to admit, I haven't read the new PCI 4, but let me talk about regular, you know, like the whole thing about more meaningful versus less meaningful in general. Mm-hmm. See, the problem is, and this is kind of related, but a little bit different. So I remember when PCI first came out, and this is like PCI version one, maybe 0. 0.4 or something. <laughs> I was at RSA conference And I met my friend who was the CISO of a, you know, not a Walmart level retailer, but let's just say very large retailer that has lots of mall presence. And I was talking to her and I'm like, how's it going? And she just turns to me and she goes, do you know how hard it is to get encryption for a mainframe? And I'm like sitting there and I go, I have no sympathy for you. She's like, what do you mean? I go, literally what you're Reading between the lines, what you're telling me is you have lots of credit cards on a mainframe computer that are sitting there unencrypted. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say this and bring this up is because a lot of people hate regulations. Oh, my God, regulations are bad. Some companies like so I, I hopefully they won't get mad at me since I'm not there anymore. But Walmart is an awesome company that has awesome security, some of the best professionals I ever worked with. And a company like that, you take basic level precautions on and like because PCI start out as you will encrypt credit cards, you will not, you know, whatever. And you think who's not encrypting credit cards. And the more secure organizations are thinking this is going to be such a pain in the ass. And the reality is why? Because they're already doing things right. Now they have to document that they're doing things right. Maybe there's a few things they'll tweak because they might have left something out. But for the most part, they're doing things right. The problem is there is 90% plus of people that will do nothing in the absence of a requirement. You know, I have my one of my IRAisms. You know, you have shoulds and you have musts. And unless something's a must, you're going to shit all over yourself. <laughs> and too many people with PCI, credit card data, are shitting all over themselves. And unless there is enforcement, because I remember the early days of HIPAA, God, I'm dating myself too on this one. But in the early days of HIPAA, I was speaking in Boise, Idaho, and somebody came up to me. He's like, what do I do? My company, I'm trying to get them to like follow HIPAA and everything like that, but they're not because they say nobody's going to come to Idaho, you know, to make an example out of somebody. And I hate to say it, but they're right. And the thing is, there were theoretically some teeth there, but not enough for a mid-size insurance provider in Idaho to do anything about it. And so when I look at PCI and I want to see some teeth, I want to see the ability where companies are going to, I don't want them to like be the random example. Like for example, I mentioned JP Morgan Chase, which does awful amount right They missed one system and they got screwed. And I don't want to see people be innocently screwed because of a black swan. But without these regulations, you're going to need to have, you would have nothing in most organizations out there. And I hope PCI, not having read it, not having read the newest version, but I hope that they are going to do something to enforce those people who wouldn't do anything in the absence of this or who try to just skirt by with the least amount of security they can. That's a, yeah, that's a great point. Everyone always rolls their eyes when you hear regulations and compliance and things like that, but it's like they're here for a reason, right? So 
Well, it's like you always see some, like there's always these stupid laws out there, like you can't ride a horse on a highway. And in America, well, unless you're in San Francisco, God, those people are morons sometimes with their laws. But, you know, most of America, you're not going to see somebody create a random law to stop somebody from doing something stupid until somebody does something stupid, like ride their horse on a highway, slowing down traffic. And so... You know, a, that's a reason for a lot of these regulations. And I just wish in many cases, I don't want to say there'd be more of them, but I just wish every organization had to adhere to at least some minimum. Again, it's like a certification, getting a CISSP. The reason I'm all for that is without that, anybody just puts up a shingle and they did this. If you were around around the year 2000 with companies like Garden out there, they would just like hire a whole bunch of people. Some of them didn't even graduate high school and they were giving them a card that's a junior. They didn't graduate high school, so they were a junior security engineer. At least the CISSP said, you know what? They went ahead, they took a test, they studied, and they have a minimum bar of information. It's not to say they're great. It's not to say they're an expert, but it stops anybody from just saying, hey, I'm a junior security engineer because I think cyber is cool. Spell K three W one. Good stuff. I I, I want to be respectful of your time and our listeners' <laughs> time. So uh, yeah, we'll, hopefully uh, we covered what you wanted to. Yeah, so no, I'm this is this has been fantastic. I do have kind of one last parting question, if you will, our signature mm-hmm. question of the podcast, and that is. Putting on your kind of security leader hat, right? Being in the role of a CISO or a security leader at, a, let's say, a large enterprise company, what do you feel is the one thing that's missing in cybersecurity right now? Like the top most important thing. This is going to sound biased, but I do think in most organizations, it's a fundamental lack of business understanding. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is, I think a lot of like I, I joke and I think like I go, you're all a bunch of losers when I attend a lot of CISO events. And the reason I say that is it's like, well, you know, they look there and they're like, well, I have this amount of budget this year. I'm really hoping to squeak out some next year. And, you know, I know I'm an expense to the organization, but I think I'm doing good. That's a loser attitude. Mm-hmm. CISOs need to go ahead and have a business understanding that even though they might not in theory generate a profit on the bottom line, they should be doing a return on investment and saying, look, and sorry, this goes like to, again, the product my company has, but I need CISOs to understand that they get a budget of X and that budget of X will return Y amount of value. So for example, most CISOs, like just imagine online retailers without embedded security within their online systems. Nobody would do business. I mean, secure, cyber security is a critical enabler of just about every business out there. But a lot of CISOs are like, well, I hope I get my budget because I think I'm doing good. They need to have the same understanding as a CFO. A CFO does nothing except track money in theory at the end of the day. But they optimize plans. They figure out how can I minimize my tax burden? How can I track things more effectively? How can I embed decision science tools into what I do to squeeze out the most profit? You know, what divisions should be shut down, unfortunately, for some workers? But cybersecurity people should understand that they are not just these geeks that are act like these, you know, prima donna assholes that think that they should be worshipped when they walk in a room, but they need to have the attitude that they are there to return a business value. They're not there to act like a privileged asshole. And they need to go ahead and say, look, I do my job. My job is this. My job is to protect the organization. I provide, I am a resource that costs money, but at the same time, I return value to the organization. And that's where they should have that respect back to, whether it's the impression of trust, whether it's protecting transactions, enabling them to do even more business or whatever. That's the attitude that especially CISOs need to have, that the workers need to have embedded within within them from top to bottom. Yep, that's a, that's a great point. And I don't think you're biased. I think it's just, 
And and I'm starting to see that shift, I feel like, where people are starting to think more and more about the business, right? Where historically security was always just focused on how can I protect this or how can I make, funnily enough, make things more difficult for the end users so that the company is safer, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not that simple anymore. It's really paying attention to the business context and the why behind what you're protecting and, and how you can do that to the best of your team's ability by thinking about the business. Yeah, again, everybody should just have this attitude, especially in cybersecurity, because they act like they're such losers, like, gee, I <laughs> I cost the company money. You know, it's like, even like a janitor, you know, you might say a janitor costs the company money, but how could they get any legitimate worker of any capability to show up if they don't have clean bathrooms? If, the tra- if all the workers have yeah. to take out their own trash and stuff. You know, it sounds menial, but honestly, there's a quality of life that has to be maintained for workers. And that's in the janitorial staff. But what about cybersecurity, maintaining a quality of security and business enablement that the organization would not otherwise have? Absolutely. Great. I'm sorry, Shane, go ahead. Go for it, man. I was just going (laughs) to say, thank you so much for... um, your, your generosity and your time today. We appreciate it and uh, are looking forward to uh, uh, more interactions with you, uh, especially at RSA. So hopefully we'll be able to connect there. Yeah, my pleasure. Just let me know. I'm always happy. I'm a whore when it comes to these type of things. So just ask. Yeah, on that note, Ira, um, is there anything else that you want to share? Uh, I know we kind of talked a little bit about your business, but if there's something that you want to mention at the end here, feel free. Well, I should give the shameless pitch for my company, you know, the size security CYE, I hate the name. I just wish they'd say CYE, but anyway, CYE security has, you know, our cyber risk quantification is literally the best in the business. I'm not biased. And, but more important, it's not just the fact we give you a number. We also make that number actionable, which other people don't do. They just randomly say, well, you might reduce your risk by implementing more awareness or do spending more on this. No, this actually gives you what is a vulnerability going to cost you? How do you mitigate it? What's the return on investment? Make good business decisions. Then I should also be shameless about my book. My, you know, my latest books are, um, what are you? Can stop stupid. I really like that one. And security awareness for dummies. Security awareness for dummies was also the bulk of it was also taken and put into cybersecurity all in one for dummies. So it's also partially in there too. And then Advanced Persistent Security is actually a pretty awesome book for, should be a desktop reference. It's in the, it's listed on the Cybersecurity Canon Hall of Fame along with Spies Among Us. Mm -hmm. Although those are the the four that are actually available for purchase. Spies Among Us is on used books. Anyway, thanks. (laughs) Yeah, no, thank you, Ira. We really appreciate your time. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.